Welcome to Club Book with Christine Enriquez. I'm thrilled to be tonight's moderator. My name is Annika Fajardo, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm a Minneapolis-based author of middle grade fiction and a memoir all centered on my experience as a Colombian-born Minnesotan. Before I begin by introducing tonight's guest properly, allow me a moment to tell you a bit more about the unique series that is bringing her to us. Club Book is a program of MELSA, the Metropolitan Library Service Associate, uh, Agency, made possible through Minnesota's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and coordinated by Library Strategies, part of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. Hennepin County Library is the co-organizer of this evening's talk. Thanks also to partnering bookseller Red Balloon Bookshop, a purchase link to The Great Divide, the book we're going to talk about tonight, it will be available in the comment section of the live stream feed have it shipped, pick it up at their lovely store in St. Paul, or have it them deliver it personally to your door if you're close. One final housekeeping note, also in the comments, you'll see a survey link. Melsa would greatly appreciate it um, if you could let them know what, the, what you think of this club book program. It's quick and easy. Our guest tonight, Christina Enriquez, is best known is best known to many as the author behind the modern classic Book of Unknown Americans, which the Washington Post lauds as, quote, a ringing pan to love in general, to the love between man and wife and parent and child, outsider and newcomer, pilgrims and promised land. Enrique's own Panamanian heritage and experience loom large in this and much of her other literary work, including the short story collection, Come Together, Fall Apart, and the novel, one of my favorites, The World in Half. Her latest, The Great Divide, hit shelves in March. It centers around the decade-long construction of the Panama Canal and the unsung workers who made this Herculean feat of engineering possible. After a few short words by Christina and some questions from me, we'll also have time for audience Q&A. So simply drop your questions in the comments thread here on Facebook, and our tech manager will route them to me. And you can also send a message to Club Book through Facebook Messenger or email where we're at clubbookmn at gmail.com. Christina, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Do you want to get us started with giving us a little bit of background about The Great Divide? I would love to. And I want to say thank you to Club Book and everybody who made it possible for me to come here and do this. It takes a lot to set up these kinds of things, I know. And thank you to everybody who's watching. Um, yeah, I'd love to say just a little bit about what brought me to this novel. It was a book that I had an idea for about 20 years ago. And I'd been carrying it around with me for all that time, just thinking that I wanted to write a novel about the Panama Canal. And really the reason for that was because as a child, I grew up going to Panama. My dad is from Panama. All of his family is still there. And so every year since I was about eight months old, we would go to Panama and visit my grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins. And oftentimes while we were there, my parents would make it a point to take my brother and sister and I on an overnight trip somewhere or a day trip outside of the city. And we often went to the Panama Canal and we would sit there in the sun, the blazing heat, and we would just watch as ships would very slowly inch their way through the locks. And I had no idea really what to make of that as a kid. I didn't have a historical context for what I was seeing. We didn't really discuss what we were doing there. I think for my parents, it was enough just to know that they were exposing us to something that was of such significance. And it wasn't until I got older and I was writing full-time, I was writing about Panama, that I really became fascinated with the idea of the Panama Canal and in this novel, I just wanted to try to get inside of it in a different way and tell the kinds of things that aren't in a textbook, the kinds of things you don't learn about in school, if you learn about it at all. And really just, I think, get to the human element of what this, you know, otherwise it's known as this greatest engineering feat of all time. But I really wanted to understand what was the humanity behind the Panama Canal. And that's what led me to The Great Divide. Wow, 20 years, that's a long time to uh, sit on an idea. 
Um, so for the people who haven't read the book, The Great Divide is set in 1907 in Panama during the building of the canal. And one of the things that really struck me is that the details are so meticulous and precise from the, everything from act, not just what's happening with the canal, but also in terms of like the clothing and what people eat and what their houses look like and what the views look like at the time. So I have... I and other readers already are asking what kind of research went into this book and how did you handle that in terms of both the history and the place? Yeah, it was an enormous amount of research, as you might imagine. I mean, I didn't know anything about 1907 in Panama, you know, in the world, really. I mean, I had to really locate myself in that time and place and I started off really just before I even put pen to paper, I researched exclusively for about six months. And I just, that really looked like reading everything that I could get my hands on. And then making lots of very disorganized lists of just like bullet points of anything that I came across that was somehow interesting or rich. Um, and I was just making lists and notebooks of all the things that I read. And then eventually that got me to the point where I started to be able to see actual scenes coming together in my mind. And I started kind of writing the book slowly, like little scenes that seemed like they were growing out of everything I was learning. And it took me another five years to write the book. So that whole time that I was writing, I was still researching. Um, and research took on you know, a different different dimension at different times. So I was still reading, of course, that everything that I could find and the internet was a great resource for that. There's actually at the University of Florida, they have this digital collection where they have everything almost that you would ever want to know about the Panama Canal, like every pamphlet that was ever printed, every photograph that has anything to do with the canal or with Panama at that time, like every map. So that was a huge treasure trove of information to find. Um, I also traveled to Panama and went to libraries there and found things that I couldn't find outside of Panama. I went to museums. I ended up talking to a few different scholars who work kind of in this space, um, one of which is Melva Lode Gooden, and she's in Panama, and another one is um, Velma Newton, who's in Barbados. And both of them, I was very fortunate to have them read drafts of the book and give me feedback on it. And then my dad was also sort of my unpaid research assistant. So every time I would encounter a stumbling block or have a question, I would call my dad or email him or text him. And he would then suddenly, you know, go off and busily find answers for me and send me links back and try to call people sometimes in Panama on my behalf and ask questions so that we get the answers to the things that I needed. But I mean, you know, it's like you can get really in the weeds with it like you get to the point where you're like I need to know that street name and you don't really need to know the street name but you feel like you do you want some kind of fidelity to that time and you you feel a responsibility too I think you know as a novelist to get it right um and there were certain things that I just couldn't find in the end and the fact that I couldn't find them I think they were almost always things that had to do with Panama specifically like like a street name or something and the fact that I couldn't find them, I think only proved to me partly why I was writing this book, which was that so much of the story of the Panama Canal has sort of been overlooked by history. So many of the people who were involved have been overlooked by history. And you know, the fact that everything from the point of view of the United States, for example, was so well meticulously documented. And yet there were these huge gaping holes for like, Panama, for example, um, that to me was only like, okay, well, that's why I'm writing this book, right? To like recenter those stories and actually include them in the history in a way that they hadn't been included. Yeah. And all of that comes out really clearly in the story itself, even though it's, you know, they're, it's during the time when it's living them. So they, but they, uh, they seem to already have that sense that their voices are going to be silenced, which is so well captured because it's, it's kind of the reality of when you're looking at these this huge powerhouse of the United States yeah. um, and commercial needs and desires from that powerhouse. Yeah, I think there was some sense that there was like a bit of a futility in it, right? Um, 
but that they needed to speak up anyway. So that was hopefully what you get in the characters. You see yeah. that coming through. So in terms of craft, did you, it sounds like you sort of like absor absorbed everything historical and then separately created this this world that you, we get we get to explore. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I I did. I was I would spend my mornings writing and my afternoons reading essentially. Um, and anything that I came across, like it, it's just a matter of, I think if you're really tuned into the work and you're really like hooked in and engaged with it, then when you're reading the things, that's all just becomes nourishment, right? That's all just like fuel for whatever you're writing at the time. And so I would just come across a sentence and that would suddenly that would bloom into a scene, you know, that otherwise I would have just come across the sentence if I hadn't already had my mind in this space and in this work. Um, but it was, so it felt kind of simultaneous, but then also like I wanted to just, as you said, sort of absorb, but then turn away from it and let it kind of bubble up in all of the ways that it needed to, and then just write and put it in and trust that what needed to get in there would get in there. Yeah, it's a beautiful. Um, early in the book, the character of uh, Ada is at home in Barbados and she sees a map of the world for the first time and realizes how small her home is, which is such a beautiful scene. And you, says, you say, she could not help but wonder what it would be like to go somewhere else. And and I love that line on just so many levels, both both personally and sort of as a representation of this book and of um, like this human desire, right, to go new places. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about that desire to explore and how it fits in with the book and maybe in, with writing in general? Yeah, that, that's interesting. No one's pointed out that line to me yet um, since I've been doing all the events for this book. Um, so it's always, it's exciting to get a new question <laughs> sometimes. Um, yeah, no, I think Ada to me was, I was thinking about what I had read again in the research, which was that there were so many people, there was actually people from like 90 different countries who came to Panama during the construction to help build the canal. And that was something I had no idea um, was true until I came across it. And the fact that there were so many people, I mean, people were coming for money, of course, people were coming for steady work. Um, but I think there was also a number of people, and, and this was borne out in some of the memoirs that I had read, were really coming because it felt adventurous to be able to come to Panama and do something different and see a new part of the world. And I thought Ada was a good character in which to embody that kind of sentiment. Um, and so, yes, yeah, she leaves Barbados to come to Panama. She leaves without telling her family that she's leaving. She stows away on a ship and somehow gets away with that and then ends up in Panama on her own. And the fact that she did that, um, like that was sort of a logistical problem, right? Like because she's a 16 year old girl, she's not gonna be able to get a contract to come to Panama. I learned that, right? She also doesn't have money to pay for her passage to come on her own. So she's gonna have to be a stowaway if she comes. And when I realized that she was, that informed so much of her character. You know, it's only a certain kind of person who's gonna leave their family and sneak on board a, a ship and sail to a whole nother country by themselves when they're 16 years old. And so just seeing Ada in this kind of bold, assertive way um, really informed so much of then who she became. But yeah, I think that idea of adventure was also embodied, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, of course, is part of the story of the Panama Canal. And he had this big adventurous spirit and was talking about Panama in those kinds of terms. I mean, the first time a sitting president ever left the United States was Teddy Roosevelt to come to Panama, to the canal. And so that was interesting to find out. Um, so there was a real like kind of sense that, you know, the people were on the precipice of something new and that Panama was where that was happening. Um, and I just wanted that to permeate the book, I think. But yeah, I also feel it's interesting that you're linking that to just writing and process because for me, writing this book felt like a departure. It felt like something new. Um, 
partly it was the way that I wrote it, but also just the actual content of the book. Like there were times I said, I would say to someone, I feel like I'm writing a novel for the first time, actually. Like that, I'm like this is like, I'm actually really writing a novel and I've never written a novel before, um, which is not true, but it just felt so different. It felt so much, I don't know, my imagination was really enlivened. I think because that was all I had to rely on, you know, the fact that it was set in 1907, I don't know anybody from 1907, <laughs> you know, like I have no lived experience in 1907, obviously. And so all I had was my imagination to come up with these characters. Um, and there was something really joyful about that. Well, I would think craft wise, it'd be really interesting because you not only just have your imagination, but you're also constrained by those, by the facts of the history. So it's kind of this interesting combination of both imagination going where yeah. you can but then yeah. like staying within where you need to be it is it's coloring it, inside the lines yeah yeah but there's a, but there's that like there's that idea right that constraints lead to more creative freedom sometimes mm -hmm. too and I think maybe that was also what was going on um you know like the Oli Poe writers or something like try to write a whole novel without an e like George Perec did or something you know it's like and then when you try it you set yourself some weird goal like that then suddenly you have you doing all of these things you never would have done before so maybe that was part of it too because I was working within those historical constraints I was able to exercise a kind of unexpected freedom as well yeah and that that really comes through um you really have the best title. The Great Divide <laughs> is so perfect. Um, <laughs> it wasn't because... <laughs> always that title. <laughs> well, just pretend it was. Pretend it was like... <laughs> the original title, the working title, as I was, the whole time I was writing, was The Cut. Just oh. The Cut. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because that's what they call, you know, this part of the canal where they're working. They're cutting through mountains and the guys would go and they would just say, we're working in the cut, in the cut, in the cut. And that phrase still shows up in The Great Divide. But I had been thinking of it the whole time as the cut. And then I thought maybe the great cut. And my publisher said, no, it's too violent. It sounds way too like, no, we can't go with cut. The word cut is not good. So they asked me to go back to the drawing board. And I had been making lists of potential other titles and the great divide was one of them so everybody liked that one but yeah, yeah. well it seems like a no-brainer <laughs> I mean it because it's not only topical but it's also thematic and the way that the book also explores um kind of thematic divides uh and and I feel like you you have a tendency to write about divides in all of your work um and that's one of the reasons I love it as I come from two backgrounds and I feel this kind of constant divide in my own identity and the work that I do. Um, and I, and I think that's one of the reasons that your work resonates for me. And um, so can you do, can you talk a little bit about these sort of metaphorical divides, kind of getting, a, getting both the met metaphor in the book, but also maybe in some of your other work or some of the, the writing that you do or the craft that you practice yeah I do think it is an it's a theme that kind of runs through a lot of my work and runs through my life um and so it surfaces in my work I guess that's not surprising but yeah I mean so for this book it's obviously a physical description of the Panama Canal but also I think you know the canal was described as for many people as something that was connecting the oceans the Atlantic and the Pacific but for other people is notably for at least one of the characters in the book who's Panamanian, he really sees it not as a point of connection, but as a point of division, something that's pulling apart the country. And so that was an interesting kind of play on just what the idea of the canal had always been for many people. And yet here the title is The Great Divide. Um, but it goes to, I think there's a lot of divisions throughout the book. There's a division of this character who I just mentioned, whose name is Francisco, and he's a fisherman in Panama, and he is not keen on the canal happening. And yet his son has decided to go work on the canal. His son is named Omar, he's 17 years old. And there's this division between the two of them. There's other divides that you see happen throughout the book, um, including there's like a racial segregation and hierarchy within the canal zone that is a source of division. But 
as you rightly point out, I mean, in much of my work, that idea of duality, that idea of division is something I'm always, I think, thinking about. Um, you know, I grew up in the United States. I grew up in, I was born in Delaware and have lived here all of my life. But as I said at the beginning, I've been going to Panama also all of my life and visiting my family there. And I think for a long time, there was a question for me of where I really belonged or where I fit in. I would go to Panama and people would see me as an American and I would be here in the United States and people would tell me that I was Panamanian, um, sometimes in nice ways and not sometimes in derogatory ways. And I think that feeling of like, where do I actually fit in? You know, where do I, where am I actually going to be accepted has been a kind of a constant question for me. Um, and I think it's taken a long time. You know, there's this phrase like dual identity. And I, I actually kind of like reject that whole phrase um, for myself. I really have spent the last few years, at least, very concertedly trying to think about myself as having a whole identity and not being fragmented in any way, not being divided in any way. Um, so, but that's, that's sort of like a lifelong mission and journey. Do you think that it is true that writers basically are writing the same story over and over again? I mean, in my case, it seems to be, I, like I said, I thought I was writing a really different book this time for The Great Divide. Um, and it is very different in a lot of ways. You know, it's historical. It it's, has all sorts of different characters and it's a different point of view. Like in lots of ways, it's different. But the themes, <laughs> which ended up being again, about belonging, about place, about home, about immigrants, you know? I mean, it's not the immigration story that we think of, but coming to the shores of Panama were people from all these different countries who were then living together in this one very small space for a number of years um, and trying to get along with each other. I mean, that is all, you know, that's a story of immigrants still. And so, yeah, it, at one point I had, a, a, there was a day of writing where I just sort of looked up and I was like, I guess I'm writing the same book again. <laughs> I mean, it's not, but it's like thematically, I just was on the same territory again. Yeah, and it's as a reader, it's fascinating to see the same thematic material presented in different ways yeah. and, and fun to see something completely different. I think um, you're like working those things out on the page, you know, yeah. I don't know. Do you do this? Like I write things because, because I don't know the answers, right? Because yeah. it's something I'm grappling with and writing helps me get closer to my answer for myself of whatever the thing is. Yeah. 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 That's probably why you have to keep asking yourself it over and over again with every yeah. different, with every project. Yeah. Um, we have a question coming from the audience, but I also wanted to, where I'm going to combine this with my own question, which is, we kind of talked about this, but I'm very curious um, how closely you stuck with the facts versus fiction. Um, and when you decided, when you made a choice to veer away. Um, and the question coming in from the audience, um, is it harder or easier to write historical fiction or completely different? Yeah, I think just completely different. And for me, it did open me up in certain ways. Although, like now that I've done it, and I, you know, spent so long, I mean, it's, it's really so much work to do all of that research and write at the same time. Now that I've done it, I, I think I said, like, that's my one historical now, like, I probably <laughs> won't do it again. Um, but I stuck pretty closely to the facts. I mean, I was doing everything from like, every train that the characters take directly corresponds to an actual train schedule from, you know, the September 1907 or October, you know, it kind of bridges the month there. Um, but like, I was looking up those train schedules and making sure, and I was tracking for myself. I'm like, okay, if Omar gets on the train at 104, then he would get off here at this time. So then would he see, a, you know, it's like, I was doing all of that and there was not, I, I didn't really have to, but it gave me a sense of like security a little bit, I think. Um, and then the only times where I fictionalized something was when I actually couldn't find it. And I had made like a very good faith effort to find something and still couldn't find it. 
Um, and then I would tell myself, I'm writing fiction. You know, like, it's okay. Like I can make these things up. Um, there's a book that I absolutely love and was my constant companion as I was writing this book, which is The Known World by Edward P. Jones. I don't know if you've ever read it, but it's it won the Pulitzer. It's like still somehow woefully underread despite that. Um, and I remember watching interviews with Edward P. Jones and there's there's things in the known world where he where it, it sounds like it must be factual, right? Like references to like a census or like insurance information or whatever. And you think to yourself, oh, if I went and looked that up, I would find it somewhere in a library. And then he, I saw him do an interview where he said, no, I just made it all up. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> you weren't about to do mind that. <laughs> blown. Like, yeah, right. We're fiction writers. You can do that, right? So I. For some reason, I stuck to the facts on this. I think it, it was sort of a security blanket for me, but um, but but I also felt okay when I had to veer off track and feel like, well, you know, this is what I'm doing is writing fiction. So yeah, um, there was an audience question that came that was um, a kind of related to this. With all of that research, were there things that you found really interesting or things that you couldn't put in the novel? Yeah. Um, yeah, there were some things about Panamanian history that just predated this book and that didn't didn't quite make it in. Um, the one really interesting thing was I mentioned that my dad was my unpaid research assistant and that I was asking him all of these questions over the course of the years that I was writing the book. And a good maybe four years into the, you know, four of five years of writing this, I was talking to him on the phone one day and I was asking him some kind of question, another yet another question. And he said to me, you know, I worked on the Panama Canal. And I was like, wait, <laughs> what? <laughs> you might have mentioned that earlier. Um, yeah, so that was that was a surprising thing to discover. But also like, it was such a nice, like we had a lot of conversations, my dad and I, that I don't think we would have had had I not written this book. Right, like I may have never known that he had worked on the Pan Panama Canal, and this and the way that he worked there was one summer after high school. You know, he just worked in the dredging division as a summer job. Um, but I might not have never, I might not have known that if I hadn't written this book. But it engendered those kinds of conversations where then I was able to really like connect with him, connect with my family, connect with my heritage um, by virtue of writing, yeah, this book. So. Yeah, um, that is that is really. It was just very, I know very parents like to leave. Out I know it's like you knew what I was years. working on, right? <laughs> like this whole time. So, yeah. Um, another question from our audience is, um, what are your favorite writing rituals or routines? And I know that you had said before we started that you have a, a an interesting an interesting technique. Yes. Well, I, so I'll say two things. One is, so again, with the known world, I mentioned it was my companion and the way that I would start every day is I would get up and I would read just a few pages of that book before I started writing. And it was just everything that I needed to get me going again every day. Um, so that became a little bit of a routine. Um, but also the thing that happened to me with this book that I had never done before was I wrote this whole book by hand in notebooks um, and they're unlined notebooks. And so the writing was like not very ordered. It was like diagonal and then it would like creep down the side and then I would have an arrow somewhere and, you know, in a tiny pocket of space, like I got these very fine nibbed pens and I would like squeeze in my work. Um, but there was a, it was kind of a revelation for me to write that way, to write by hand in notebooks. And I think it changed my writing stylistically. Um, there was something about actually moving my hand across the page that had the effect of kind of dragging my thoughts out. And so my sentences, I think, became a bit longer with more dependent clauses. Like it was there was some interaction there between the physical and the mental um, kind of burgeoning of language. Um, 
so that was interesting. And then it was just very intimate as well, right? Like I was getting super close to the page every morning, hunched down, and there was no distractions. It was like the whole world was just right here for me. And all I could see was these characters and I could all I could hear was the words in my mind. And it was so pleasurable to write in that way and not something I had experienced before. Um, so yeah, it, it was also, I think the other thing about it that was really lovely was that it functioned like a trick, right? So if I'm writing in a notebook, as opposed to writing on a computer, you know, you're writing on the computer and you're sitting there and you're like, this is official, I am writing a novel. And then as soon as you have that kind of thought, whether it's in your subconscious or not, immediately for me anyway, what happens is pressure just crowds in. You know, my internal critic, like all the self doubt, like everything just starts like going haywire. But in the notebook, I just felt like I was kind of messing around. You know, like I could almost trick myself into thinking like no one's ever gonna read this. And so yeah. when you can get to that point, something magical happens, I think, where you really open yourself up, you feel free to explore, to experiment, you feel free to be terrible on a given day and not judge yourself for it because it's like, whatever, no one's gonna read this, who cares? And so it became more like play than work. Um, and that was that was a really meaningful and beautiful thing for me. It seems really also maybe um, you know cap a way to capture that historical part of it. There wasn't computers in 1907. Right, people were right. writing things by sure. hand then, yeah. right? And think life was slower was like, then. At one point, I remember like research. I was like, "Do they have paper? Like, what? <laughs> what's happening in 1907? What are they writing on?" Actually, uh, I mean. And you had to think, it wasn't only historical in general, right? It's like historical specific to like Barbados. Like what do they have? What is What do they have in Panama? Like what kind of paper would they have had? What kind of writing <laughs> utensils do they have? Like it was, it was interesting. It was such a trip to do all that research. But it, you know, it really gave me a different um, sense not only of the Panama Canal, of course, but of the whole context of the, that historical moment. And that was that was really interesting to discover. And did you go to Barbados also? I did not. I haven't been yet. I had a reader. That sounds fabulous. I know, right? Uh, yeah, I could. Um, that would be like a business expense. Maybe I get to go to Barbados. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Um, another question from the audience. Uh, if you know, how has this book been received by Panamanians? And I'm wondering if, I'm not sure if they mean Panamanians or Panamanian Americans. Um, well, I do know that, uh, so if, you know, Panama is a small place where everybody knows everybody. So somehow <laughs> my like dad's sister's niece was at work and the book club at like a, there was like a group of women who are at a book club where she works and they read my novel and this all kind of came back to us. Um, and they, I don't even know how they got it or like, it's not in Panama. Like they had the United States, you know, version, hardcover version, and they had somehow gotten their hands on it and they had all read it. Um, and so that was very sweet. And I saw some pictures on Instagram where they made cakes that were like in the, <laughs> like going off some of the motifs on the cover, like the fish and the frog and stuff. Um, and so that was kind of cool to see, but um, I'm hopeful it'll come out in Spanish in August. And so that will be fun um, to be able to connect with readers who want to read it in Spanish. And then I'm hopeful that it will actually be published in Panama and available. And yeah, yeah. I think that would be meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. Well, there's also a question about the cover art and all the little designs Aren't they cool? It. Yes, they are very cool. Yeah, no, um, they did it to um, evoke the idea of a mola, which is a traditional indigenous Panamanian art form. Um, and so you, you can see like little, you know, in the corners, those little um, motifs, I think. I, I remember I showed it to some people when we had, I had been in Panama last August. And so I had a cop, like it on my phone, I had the artwork. And I pulled it up and I showed it to them. And they said, oh, 
oh, it's like a mola. And I'm like, if you're Panamanian, you will know that. And I just love <laughs> that there's that on the cover. Um, but yeah, so they put all these, you know, the fish are important. Francisco, like I said, is a fisherman in the book. It's interesting how the top half of the book, I think, is all like nature and then like all the natural world. And then there is this division. There's these two men sitting in a boat who I think are Francisco and Omar at the like, you know, heart of the book, right in the middle there. Mm -hmm. And the lower half is everything that's like human influence, like industry. You have the shovel, you have the mosquito, like that's the story of the canal then on the mm -hmm. bottom half. Yeah, I, they did a beautiful job with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very, it's very lovely. And um, for, for, re for readers who don't know how covers come about, do you want to talk about that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I had nothing to do with it. So yeah. <laughs> I can't take any credit for how, how wonderfully it turned out. But um, my wonderful publisher, you know, they were really behind this book. Um, and they've been so great. And they came up with a few options for the cover. One was like a photographic treatment of the canal. And then they had this other one they had a designer come up with. Um, and she did actually first I saw it in black and white. So what you see, but without any color um, is what she came up with. And as soon as we saw that, everybody was like, yes, that's that's the cover, you know? I mean, most books about the canal have that photographic treatment where, you know, you see the winding water going through the mountains. Um, and I just wanted something that felt very different. And again, that felt very Panamanian. Um, so that was important to me. And then and then she added all the color in and I was like, oh, it's so good. It's so good. That's lovely. And 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 so good at capturing what's inside of the book too. Yeah. Um I, so in in the book. While the North American government and businesses are dreaming about this opening, like you said, it was like going to be a connecting this this mm -hmm. power of 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 industry. All the characters in the book are also striving towards something. Ada's trying to earn money to save her sister, and Omar is trying to separate himself from his father's life. Um, there's John Oswald trying to eradicate malaria. So there's all kind of everyone is is moving towards something. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about the idea of striving or searching for a goal, especially as now that I know how long you worked on this <laughs> in particular, but I think it also is another theme that comes up in your books about kind of moving towards something, mm -hmm. kind of the idea of the American dream. And, mm -hmm. um, and then I'm going to relate it in my mind back again to being an artist or writer in the way that you need to strive towards things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, part of it is just creative writing 101, like the character has to want something. Um, and so, you know, a little bit of it is that, but that's the like very kind of flattened version of it. Um, and then just really, you ha I have to spend a lot of time getting to know my characters and really understanding them. I think the key for me as a writer, as it is for me as a reader is not necessarily to like the characters but to understand them um and I spend a lot of time writing material that never ends up in the book just in service of understanding them and I think understanding what they really want and it can be a specific goal and it can be a general goal right like so you have someone like John Oswald, who is from Tennessee. He comes to Panama with his wife, Marion Oswald. And he comes really because his ambition is to be to go down in history as someone who has made a difference in his field. And his field is basically mosquitoes. He wants, he's known as kind of the foremost mosquito expert in the world. And he's missed the boat on yellow fever. And that is, I think that was, when I realized that, um, that was what sort of made him come alive for me is the fact that yellow fever has been eradicated basically in 1906. And yet this book takes place in 1907. And I thought like I had already had it set in 1907 when I was trying to figure out John Oswald. And when I realized that this was you know, the coincidence of the history that 
yellow fever had been eradicated, I thought, well, then what is his purpose, right? What, how's, how's he make sense as a character anymore? And then it dawned on me like, oh no, he's disgruntled because he's missed this opportunity to have been part of eradicating yellow fever. And so he's going to come to Panama now because malaria is still the like persisting and is a huge problem. In fact, like in 1908, I think 80% of the workforce in Panama actually got hospitalized for malaria that year. So it's still an enormous problem that they have to tackle. And I just thought, well, okay, this goes to all of his motivations though, right? Of why he has come. And it's the same for someone like there's a doctor in the book um, from France, his name is Pierre Renault, and he decides to come to Panama because the story of the French in Panama has essentially been reduced to the failure of the French. You know, the French had tried to come in 1880s and build a Panama Canal and it ended in failure. And I just thought, well, he has something to prove, right? So he's gonna come to Panama because he wants to prove that a Frenchman in Panama can be successful. That's interesting. Um, and so just finding all the kinds of nuances of what people really want and why they want those things is always, that's always a fascinating, I don't know, journey of discovery, really, right? I, I don't sit down and like know who my characters are. I'm not just like sitting down to tell a story. I'm sitting down to find the story. You know, I have to figure out why it is that Francisco doesn't want the Panama Canal to happen in Panama. Like, what is his actual problem? And discovering over time how resistant he is to all change and why he's holding on so closely to the past, right? And then trying to build up that story. Like, what is it in the past that he's holding on to? Okay, let's figure that out. Like, you know, all the different avenues that it takes you down. I think that exploration and that discovery is is a large part of why I sit down and write every day. And I love the way that, that as a reader, we um, we discover them along with you as we go through the book. You know, this, what is he, what is the French guy doing there? What What is this this couple from Tennessee left their nice life? Yeah, yeah. You know, for and this, it's so little by little. To see and it. the question too then, I think that's always interesting, is like, will they get what they want, right? And if they don't, then what? You know, and some of them do and some of them don't. And you see all of that kind of play out in the book. And that always ends up being interesting to me, both, again, as a writer and as a reader. Mm -hmm. So you use the word ambition about John Oswald, which makes me think about um, uh, about careers and writing. And um, was it always your ambition to be a writer? Oh, not until I was in high school. I was always a reader as a kid. Um, I read a lot of books. I would come home with the scholastic book order form and <laughs> beg my parents to buy all of the books that were in there. Um, and, you know, I was totally the kid who was just like walking around with my nose in the book and coming to the dinner table with the book. And um, yeah, I think it wasn't until I was in high school, though, that it occurred to me that maybe writing was actually something that I loved as much as I loved reading. And by the time I left for college, I knew, I think that I wanted to be a writer. I didn't know what that looked like though. I didn't know what that would mean. My dad, I think was very concerned I wouldn't get a job <laughs> as a writer. <laughs> so he urged me maybe to try journalism instead, um, which is I think partly how I ended up at Northwestern um, because they had a very good journalism program, but I never set foot in the journalism school. I ended up becoming an English major and I learned pretty early on that they had an undergraduate creative writing major that you had to apply to get into. So I applied for it. It was like a year long sequence um, to complete that major. And I applied to it and I did not get in. And I was absolutely devastated. And I remember just thinking like, well, I guess I'm just gonna be an English major and the universe is telling me that I shouldn't be a writer. Like, you know, it, I was very dramatic about it. <laughs> um, and then I had a teacher who I saw off campus one day and she, my poetry teacher, and she came up to me and she said, do you think you might apply again to the writing program? I didn't even know you actually could apply again. Um, 
but I did because she asked me that. And then I got in the second time. So I did it, I completed it my senior year. Um, but yeah, and then, I don't know, I thought I should go to graduate school and I applied to five graduate schools when I was leaving undergrad and I got rejected to every single one. And I got a job instead at the University of Chicago Press, which was a wonderful place to work with wonderful people. And I wrote short stories during the day when I was, when I was technically probably supposed to be working. <laughs> and I would print them on the company printer. <laughs> and then I would mail them to my old professor at Northwestern, my writing teacher, and he would mark them up for me and he would mail them back to me and I would fix them and then I would send them to magazines and I would get rejection after rejection. But I don't know, I was just like determined to do this thing. Um, and it wasn't, it was like a year and a half of that. And then I applied again to graduate programs. I just really wanted to do it. I just thought if I don't do it now, I'll probably never do it again. And I, first one I heard back from that second time was the Iowa Writers Workshop. So I got to go there and spend two amazing years just writing, doing nothing but writing, which was blissful. That is, that is the ultimate work hard and uh, persevere through your, through your setbacks and succeed in the end. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, uh, it was, it's interesting to me when I think back on myself that, that I had that kind of drive, you know, that I just really, I don't know. I just loved it so much. And I just really wanted to have a life where this is what I got to do. And I'm so grateful every day. Like, it's amazing to me to get up and that the, you know, this is the work that I get to do. And so another question from a reader, what or what advice would you have for an aspiring novelist, particularly one who is in their MFA track? Oh, I mean, the older I get, the less inclined I am to give advice. <laughs> I think like everyone has to sort of figure out their own way. Um, I mean, read is the ultimate advice. Just read as much as you can and and read and then read like a writer too, I think is important, right? Which are two kind of different things. Reading just for pleasure and for the entertainment, for the story is one mode of reading, but then reading like a writer to me means stopping yourself when you feel something as you're reading, right? Whether you, what you feel is a sense of awe, what, whether what you feel is that there was something that was just funny and you laughed or you feel emotional, you feel sad in some way, to stop yourself and try to break apart the few pages that you just read that led you to that feeling and understand how the writer was able to pull that off, like how they were able to accomplish that. And I think, for me, oftentimes it's useful to think about um, the inverse choice that could have been made, right? So like, oh, this per this character spoke at this point and said this. Well, what if this other character had spoken at this point instead? Or what if this character had said the opposite thing? Like, what would the effect of that have been? And when you start thinking about it from the inverse it starts to give you a sense of like, oh, that's why that works because that choice is actually better or more effective in producing this effect. Um, and so that I think is always like kind of just a fun exercise to try to learn from in writing. But I think the other thing I would just say is to not, it's easy, it's really easy to get hung up on what everybody else is doing and what everybody else seems to be producing and achieving and the success that other people seem to be having. And in the end, it does not matter how fast you write, it only matters how well you write. And so to spend that time really with your craft and you know, like someone can publish five books and they can just be, as my daughter would say, mid, you know, <laughs> but if you spend that same amount of time writing an amazing, incredible book that you feel really good about, that's all that matters. Well, I have to say, I have my copy of, and you see the post-it. This is uh, reading like a writer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. For uh, that. The post-it's all smudged. You don't know what it said. <laughs> I love it when someone comes up to me at a book signing and they 
book has all these like flags in it. And <laughs> I'm like, that's a loved book. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, a another question from a reader. Um, during oh, uh, first one is um, during uh, writing. Oh, when we were talking about you writing writing by hand. Um, and of course, it must be so slow. Yes, I, I can't even imagine. Um, do new ideas or word choices come to you because you are going at that pace? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think um, my mind, I, I wrote an essay about this, but I think when I'm typing, my mind is outpaced by the typing, right? It, it's not like the typing isn't slow enough to catch everything. And, and the writing by hand isn't quite either, you know, like there's still things I'm sure that are slipping through the sieve of my mind, but um, it's slow enough that I catch more. And yeah, I think it gives me just enough more time to think of a different word choice. I also became like, I adopted my own kind of shorthand, you know, like I would write a word and then if I wasn't quite satisfied with that, I would just double slash and try again, write a new one. Uh, that's a little better. Double slash again, write another one, and then move on with the sentence. Um, you know, or I would get some to a word and I would just circle it. That's not quite it. Come back to that later. Work on that word a little bit more. Like things like that, that are seem to be easier when you're writing by hand for me too, right? Like the notations mm -hmm. that doesn't I disappear can. when you're. <laughs> The delete yeah. doesn't make it this Well, and I can't, like, if I'm in Microsoft Word, I guess I can double slash easy enough, but I can't circle a word easily, you know, or something mm -hmm. like that. I can't, like, star something mm -hmm. easily. It's, it's like there was a whole different notation that cropped up because I was writing by hand and I could do what I wanted. So I've been keeping a journal most of my life very sporadically, but but that I write by hand. And there is no way I can ever go back and read any of it. I can't read. I can't understand. <laughs> I can't make it tell what I've written. So how did you go from transferring from notebooks into, I assume you had to eventually put it into yeah. the computer. Eventually, yes, it has to get into the computer. I mean, I adopted a system at some point where I would work Monday through Thursday writing by hand, and then I would reserve Friday for moving it all into the computer, like that week's work. And I did that partly because of exactly what you're saying, because if I, I learned that if I waited any longer than that, I couldn't actually track what I had done before. Like I could read my handwriting, but there were so many arrows and so like this to here and no, not this part. And then I would start like numbering, like things were in so many places that I would have to number it. I'd be like, you know, the order of the paragraphs that I, how I actually wanted them to show up. I would, you know, one through six or whatever, but I couldn't, if, if it got longer than a week away, I couldn't actually like reconstruct it very well or very easily. Um, so yeah, that's what I became. On Fridays was my day for moving everything in. And Fridays, interestingly, were like my least favorite day, you know. It's more creativity, because, right? It's no, it's not creative. Although, you know, you're you're still editing as you're moving. Like sometimes those double slashed, those three options for words, I would make that choice as I was moving it into the computers. So there's like a little bit that's happening, but I think for me, it became concretized on that day, right? It felt in the notebook somehow still like flexible, malleable, whatever. And of course, I mean, in Word, I can still change things and easily delete and move, copy and paste, whatever I want, but it felt more like, it had gotten solidified in a way that I didn't love every Friday, but it was necessary. You know, I'm not going to send my editor a notebook full of all my scribbles. So. Uh, do you think moving forward, you're going to continue to to write long? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I got like very unprecious about it too. Like it became where I was just taking pieces of printer paper. Like I would just grab whatever was there as long as it was online. That seemed to be somehow part of the key for me. Um, but I would just grab a paper and I would fold it in half and then I would just keep writing. And I, I had, I mean, it was a lot to keep track of. Um, you know, there's no control F. <laughs> there's no like yeah. fine function. So there were times where I was like, I know I wrote this. I know it's somewhere. And I just could never find it again. Uh, and, and are you working on a new project right now? Um, not That you can talk about? 
Not in a very active way. I'm working on it in the in the super nascent stage where it's just kind of marinating. And I'm taking some notes about maybe the structure could be this or what if this, you know, but it hasn't coalesced yet. And I and I've learned enough now at this point in my career not to force it. Right. Like if I sit down, I mean, I could just sit down and just start working on the thing that I think it is. Um, but I think it my hunch is it won't come out the way I want it to. If I do that, it has to be a little bit more alive in my mind before I can go to the page. A little bit of kind of thinking time and developing before it, before you can kind of claim it as, a, as your story. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I have to, I, do you do that? Like I have to see the shape of things. In yeah. Life, yeah. You know? And There's it's like, something. I can't see the shape of it quite yet. It's right now. It feels like floating clouds. Like it's like, uh, oh, there's that, like I could grab them, but they're kind of wispy still. Like it hasn't mm -hmm. kind of come together yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you like being in that spot? No. Or do you like being in the middle? No, I don't know. I like the <laughs> okay. middle. <laughs> <laughs> right now I'm a little frustrated with myself, but I'm also telling myself, this is how it works. And you know that, and it will come when it comes and it's okay, you know, but no, it's way better. The middle is the best part. The, the beginning is horrible because you're just getting it off the ground and it just feels like, oh, like it's so heavy. And you just, to get it moving in any direction always feels like a tremendous amount of effort. And then the middle is, wondrous and beautiful you're so happy like it like I don't know you walk around in the world and it's like no matter what's happening you've got this thing on the burner and you know it's cooking and you just feel like happy about it and you're ready to get back to it and then the end is also not great you know because <laughs> you're like gonna part from this thing that you love yes yeah, very hard to part and there's the anxiety of like, well, now other people will read it. And what are they going to think? And, you know, there's all of that that goes into it, too. It's yeah. very safe when it's just in your, yes. under your control. Yes. Do yeah. you like the middle the best? I do. I you? love the middle. Yes. The middle, there's no better place. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's seen it yet. No. Yeah. It's just you. You get to live with these characters. Ada yeah. and Omar can just walk around with you. Yeah, and they're like alive. They're like speaking to you. You, you know, it's not the effort of like getting them going. Um, yeah, it just all feels so good in that part of it. Yeah. So a final question from the audience. Uh, speaking of these characters being alive, the uh, the reader says that this talk has made your book come alive. Do you see your book being produced as a movie in the future? Oh gosh, it's really hard for me to think of. Like, you know, they made like an audio book. I can't even get to that part in my head where it's like, oh, these characters are talking now. That's so weird to <laughs> me, right? Like, because I hear them in a certain way. And then to hear, I mean, the actors do such a beautiful job with it, but it's always so strange to me to hear my books being read aloud. Um, so a movie is a whole nother level. I don't know. I mean, you know, we'll see what happens. Um I, I mean, I have a film agent who, you know, gonna take it to the people and see what happens. I don't know what will happen. But to me, it's like, I just can conceive of it as a book. So it's hard for me. That's what- You've already got the movie in, in your own head. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. I That's what all those amazing other professional people are for, you know, having that vision. But for me, this, this is where I live, yeah. Yeah. Well, for anyone who hasn't read it, you now you can also know you can have the opportunity to listen to it too. <laughs> well, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. This was a really fabulous talk, Christina. Um, and that is all we have time for. Um, this has been a virtual presentation of Club Book, a long running literary series of MELSA made possible by the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Special thanks again to Hennepin County Library for the part they played in bringing Christina to us. Before you log off, look for the club book survey link, which is in the comments and will be projected here in momentarily. Last, consider joining club book this Thursday, April 18th for their next virtual program. This one featuring New York Times chart topping social satirist Kylie Reed, author of Such a Fun Age and most recently Come and Get It, 
You can learn more about that and other upcoming events at clubbook.org. Have a great night, everyone.